got a new album coming out. It's called Don't Believe the Truth. It's good, man. I'm having it. There's some, you know, some nice little numbers on there for the ladies. And there's some out and out rock and roll songs on there. A lot of hidden depths. Yeah. A lot of trapdoors. Yeah. Not done with smoke and mirrors. Yeah. And just Snakes when and I ladders. when I get it, my favourite place for me is in my headphones. And I love it. That is why he was in the band before he fucking rehearsed with us. That kind of shit. I concur with my <laughs> fucking friend from the north. Wouldn't command the bell. I think it's fucking great. <laughs> 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 Well, all right. If you like Forever Changes and Highway 61 Revisited and uh, Revolver, then here you go. Have that. We finished touring the last album in the beginning of 2003. We knew we were going to be having a, a year off. But almost from that moment, there were demos knocking about. Andy had sent me a CD with four tunes on, and um, the two songs, Keep the Dream Alive and Turn Up the Sun, instantly, well, they were definitely going on the record. From the first time I heard it, it was always going to be the opening track on the album. And um, it was originally going to be the title of the album. I just thought it was a brilliant, brilliant title. When I wrote Turn Up the Sun, I didn't imagine that it was it didn't give me an Oasis vibe at all. It was very soft, a lot softer than it ended up being. It starts off with a bit of music that is a bit of a surprise to anyone that's expecting an Oasis rock tune, but then it does lead you back into the Oasis rock tune. It's kind of got that glam thing going on, but also the intro and the outro are kind of quite scouse for me anyway. Yeah, man, I mean, Turn Up The Sun is amazing. I like the guitar bits at the beginning and the intro and the outro, and it's a top tune. It instantly sounds like Oasis, which is, which is bizarre. <laughs> this song is a behemoth. Recorded 65 times, tracked 3,000 tracks, and it's just, it's just a wall of sludgy aggression. And it actually, the lyrics make perfect sense when you realise it was written by Andy Bell, who lives in Sweden. I think both Gim and myself are feeling more comfortable with, with the idea of, of right, well we're in you know we're we're in the band now, we've been in it for a while. We can we can suggest whatever we want to suggest, we can say what we feel. Andy's a great songwriter, it's always Gem, you know, and without them we'd be treading water a bit, you know what I mean? I don't know, you know what I mean, but they they've brought a lot to the band, you know what I mean? Musically and personally, they're top lads. <laughs> Mikey Fingers has got this kind of pounding kind of sounds. Everything is, is kind of pretty much on the same beat all the time. That came out of listening to Velvet on the go in the dressing yeah. room one night, wait, Kurt playing Waiting wait for the man. It wasn't on the map of getting tarted up somehow. No. It was just That's it. whatever that, it. What, how mm. that air moved was part of the record. It's got an amazing harmonica solo on it, the Gem Place, which you think, you're not sure what it is. It starts off like a guitar and then it sounds like a, a, an underground train break. Him just going, keep going, keep going, keep going. <laughs> so I'm trying to put my eye in. <laughs> we came back from Cornwall. After a few weeks of, of being here, we, we realised we were going to have to get a real producer in. I could be your lover, you could be your mind. I've never worked with a band that's gotten to the studio before me every freaking day. I mean, I'd be like, oh, I'm going to beat those bastards down there today. Get up there, get at 11, walk in, limbs and they're strumming a guitar. You could be I've never met guys like it. They can't get in the studio fast enough. I mean, the first day of recording, I thought I'd be the first one there. So I'd get there about midday, and Liam's pushing the cases up the ramp into the studio. He's not doing the loading, you know? Every song on this record was recorded in at least three to four studios. 
I would say the entire album was recorded unorthodoxly. I mean, you hear these stories, you know, growing up, being interested in the recordings and the Beatles, and the one that always fascinated me would be like Strawberry Fields, where you heard they had to combine all these different versions, and you're like, oh, what was going through their minds at the time? Well, I think I know now. He's a good referee, which is the main criteria for anybody getting involved with fucking the shower here. Is, you know, somebody's got a referee, Gemma and Andy, a right pair in the fucking studio. Always at it. Yeah, look, dude, I'm fucking playing the bass. No, man, I'm playing fucking bass. <laughs> There is a book called The Importance of Being Idle, and it's, it's all passages of that people have written down the years about how having nothing to do is probably the greatest job in the world. And uh, I suppose if there's a story behind it, it's like, well, everything will look after itself in its own time. I sold my soul for the second time, cause the man don't pay me. The falsetto thing fitted the song, and I was really fucking impressed at myself when I started singing that. Not that I could get that high, but like, hey man, that sounds fucking brilliant. comes to do it live, it's going to take a lot of deep breaths, but it's kind of like, well, fucking come on then, let's see how good you are. I'd describe it as a whimsical tune, in, in the best meaning of the word, you know, and um, I've, I've always enjoyed those tunes Noah's written. Um, it's a bit of breathing space from, from more of the heavy, heavier stuff, you know. And it's got this keyboard on it that I bought for 50 quid. Found it on eBay. Jason Rhodes, our guitar tech, got it down from the fifth floor of a block of flats. <laughs> Put it into the back of his Land Rover and brought it back. I mean, it's just a great four and a half minute song, I think, you know. And the playing is really understated. I think it's all, to me it sounds like the Kinks doing the Lars, or the Lars doing the Kinks. When I first heard Love Like a Bum, I thought single, you know, straight away. A perfect summer tune. I didn't like that fucking thing. I wrote it a couple of years ago, actually. I just wanted it sort of to be a bit Elvis, you know, a bit acoustic in that. We've done a demo of it. And uh, all I see with that is Julie fucking Christie, man. It's the vision I get. I just wanted, you know what I mean? It's sort of like about a woman or women in general. It's meant to be uh, pastoral and uplifting in a laddie kind of way. You turn me out, looks like a clown, in my mind. It's almost like um, a songbird for this album. You know, Songbird was my favourite on the last album. Um, this is, again, a, a, a really beautiful Liam tune. Songbird blew my head off when I first heard it because it was that fucking simple and that direct. But see, like, you know, when Liam plays you a song, he wants you to instantly fucking drop dead on the spot. And then when you come round, stab yourself in the heart at the, at, at, and be in sort of awe of the fucking sonic ability of the man. It was pretty surprising for me because it was really kind of a, a, a light up song, which is not what you think of when you think of Oasis. I just think that song is actually rather pretty. <laughs> shows a side of himself in his songs which he doesn't often show in, in, in um, his public life, you know, and it's, it's, it's brilliant, you know, Love Like a Bomb, great idea for a song. Yeah, He's learnt guitar on his instincts. He's now come to a place where he can play guitar as well as anyone else. Um, He's got his own style, and he's, he's basically invented his own chords all the way along. He always plays the guitar as if he's trying to sort it in half, and, um, and it, all, all he does is get... All he, and he, and he, he gets about four bars in, and he goes, dunk, and he goes, Jason! I got a soul, you man, a meaning of soul. It's two chords, isn't it? Just straight, you know, just fucking having a rant, I suppose, at all, you know what I mean? Not thinking too hard about things. You just want it as raw as possible, and um, and it, and you know it, it doesn't mess around really. I think it's done in about two minutes. 
That was one of the first few songs I heard, and that, that pretty much blew my head off. We were trying to get a sound reminiscent of Elvis Presley's drummer, DJ Fontana, on the early records like Hound Dog, Jazz Rock, kind of thing. And that old Buddy Holly sound, like fucking, really fucking, really. And that you're getting it on the snare, and that was a bit, a bit like fucking too rocky. So we got this old box of fucking like Cheerios or something. We got that on it, and he's just got these fucking spoons that are banging. It gives it this kind of, it's like a bit more percussion than a snare. Really, so. Where's the spoons? Get spoons on it. Get spoons, spoons. It's ferocious, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's. Uh, to me, it's, it's like Elvis in Sun Studios, and it's just like right in your face. It's not an anthem, me and soul, it's a fucking spit, isn't it? I love it. I fucking love it. It's like Liam after five brandies, you know. Which I'm, I've got on first hand experience. I struggled to remember who the fuck played what. I, yeah, he, he plays bass, he plays bass, I play bass, he plays harmonica, I play a bit of it, he plays guitar. It's yeah. fucking. It's fucking bizarre. There's four guys who are all songwriters, they're all singers. They're all guitar players, they're all producers, and they're all fucking drummers. So what comes to mind about Part of the Cute apart from its golden brown bongos via Manchester? Part of the Cue is more in the world of the driving acoustic numbers. Great melody, really cool vibe, just a good song. I was in the Waitrose one afternoon, I only went out for a fucking pint of milk, right? I got so fucking irate at the, the, <coughs> the queue that there's like ten fucking checkouts, I think, and there's like two little old ladies, and it's like, I don't know if it's a rush hour for buying food, but it was in the rush hour, right? I kind of stood at the back with this pint of milk thinking, I want to fucking steal this if nobody takes the money off me right fucking now, you know. <laughs> it's fucking wrong because it leads to shoplifting. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the Dream Live, another one of Andy's tunes. Four seasons, seconds, flicker, flash, I'm alone. When you get that on the headphones and the chorus kicks in, it just goes, man. I'm a stranger to this place where we are and dreams come. Well, the first thing I had for that tune was, was actually a sample from the film Stardust with David Essex. It's a great film. David Essex is in it. That was the, the, the seed that started it. It was just uh, someone that is having trouble finding the reason for, for keeping on with the dream. You could ride a scooter off a cliff on with that one. It's really daunting, you know. Noel's written some of the, the greatest tunes of all time, and Liam is writing some of the greatest tunes of all time, and then suddenly you've got to go, hello! But that's what it's all about, really. And I love it. A little space, a little time, see you. Uh, my favourite lyrics on the album have always been A Bell Will Ring. Um, I think it's an unbelievably positive lyric, and it's, it's, it's a real typical gem philosophy. Well, you know, A Bell Will Ring. Apparently, it's Ringo Starr's favourite track on the album. I see the two meanings in that. One is the bell will ring, as in something's going to go off, your light's going to go off in your head, and the other one is that Andy Bell may call. I always get a phone call once every six weeks, someone goes, Andy's trying to get older. And I always think, oh, what the fuck. <laughs> it's always about nothing. I know, it's Andy. All right, what time is it there? About 10 past five. What are you doing? Nothing. <laughs> no, right, I'm off. <laughs> Closest anybody has ever got sounding like Revolver, I think, to me. Everybody is purporting to tell you the truth, and it's like, I wouldn't believe any of it. None of it. Make your own fucking mind up. The 
truth. It's always been, I mean, it's always been important with us because we're not a bunch of, we're not liars, we don't fake, it is what it is. Let there be love. Let there be love's a classic, I love that. Let there be love is probably my, my, my favourite track. And I don't know why. Come on, baby blue. Shake up your tired eyes. The world is waiting for you. The most classic, beautiful track. When I hear an Oasis record, that I, I want to hear a song like that. I had my arm twisted by Dave Sardi, Liam, and our manager about Let There Be Love. I was like, can we not for once put an album out? without the flag waver on. Keep on clapping Just remember I'll be by your side Let There Be Love is a tune that you could make so big and it would, I don't know, become maybe a bit too predictable. It's supposed to be more of a sigh more than a fucking, you know. For any artist that's been around for more than two records, you constantly have to be going back to what is it that makes me want to do this. Oasis never lost it. I mean, how many bands out there have been around as long as Oasis have, put out as many records that people cared about, and then still come back and are excited to go to work and make music? I feel really comfortable playing these guys, you know, and it sounds really good when we play. These guys are so on it musically. They've really got it down, you know, and uh, they're more on it than anyone I've ever met.